Hello, I'm Mercedes Stevenson, and this is the West Block, politics, perspectives, and players. Late last week, the Chinese government charged two Canadians, Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig, with espionage and more. Here is Prime Minister Justin Trudeau reacting to that news. We uh, have continued to express our uh, disappointment uh, with the Chinese decision, with the Chinese uh, detention of these two Canadians. We will continue to advocate uh, for their release, for their return to Canada, uh, while highlighting, of course, uh, that uh, we, uh, we have an independent judicial system. Spavor and Kovrig have been detained in China since December of 2018. Their arrest came after Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou was arrested in Vancouver. Where does the relationship between China and Canada go from here? Joining me now to discuss this is Canada's former ambassador to China, David Mulroney. How are you, Mr. Mulroney? Hi, Mercedes. How are you? Very well, thanks. Obviously, we're all thinking of the state that Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig must be in right now, how they must feel. What was your reaction to China finally laying charges after a year and a half? In a way, uh, we saw this coming. This was inevitable because what China has been doing is a crude parody of the Canadian legal system. At every step in the Meng Wanzhou extradition process, China has followed it with um, a step of its own that's designed to prolong the detention of our two Canadians for at least as long as Ms. Meng is in, um, in her judicial process in Canada. So we had the ruling in Canada a couple of weeks ago on double criminality and the fact that Ms. Meng lost that means that the case will go on at least until next spring. And so, uh, as expected, the Chinese have now announced another step in their process, completely fake, completely spurious, which puts our two poor Canadians uh, in the same kind of jeopardy they've been in for so many days, so many hundreds of days, um, for some time. So that, that with the charges, a process begins that could take uh, up to a year or more. It'll take exactly as long as the Chinese Communist Party thinks it needs to take to send us a message and to put pressure on us. Are the charges the message alone, or are Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig in more danger now because they're closer to a trial and therefore potentially closer to a sentence? In one sense, yes, because technically the Chinese could say, well, you know, we can't do anything now because we have rule of law and we've got to let the court decide. But the reality is that courts decide according to the party. And Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig will be held exactly as long as the party thinks they need to be held, regardless of the process. So in that sense, things have not changed. But what continues, as you indicated, is this very cruel isolation for two men. Because of the pandemic, uh, they have not had consular visits. Uh, Mr. Kovrig, as we discovered on your show, ha had a call from his father, a single call. Uh, they're living, you know, with the lights on 24-7 in, in crowded cells. They have very little room to walk around, very little to divert themselves. It's a cruel and terrible situation, and it's going to continue for some time. What do you think of the government's response? We heard from the prime minister. Some people have said they need to be tougher on China. Others say that doesn't matter because until Meng Wanzhou is released, this will be the situation. What are your thoughts? I think the prime minister has failed on two counts. He's speaking to two audiences. One audience is China, and he needs to be franker and tougher and more honest because the Chinese are watching. If they determine that he will continue to be as um, friendly, uh, as careful in his use of language as he has been, there's no cost to them. Uh, they know that they have him where they want, want him, and they, they'll continue to put pressure on us. The other message, though, is Canadians. Canadians need to hear that the prime minister is deeply concerned, that he's outraged about what's happening to our Canadian, to our, our two Canadian citizens. Uh, one of the Canadian sub-audiences is, of course, the public service of Canada, but the foreign service. When they hear the prime minister speaking like that, they get the message that it's kid gloves, that we don't want to rock the boat, that we don't want to change anything, that we're trying to get back to the status quo. So he needs to change his language, not in an, in an unreasonable way or in a way that, that seeks to provoke the Chinese, but that one that is guided by facts and it expresses the concern that Canadians deeply feel. Do you think there's value in some kind of economic retaliation? I don't think retaliation in this sense works simply because the Chinese system is so different. 
they can take uh, a lot more pain than we can. And what retaliation means is that some Canadian sectors some w will be targeted. And that's, you know, we have a democracy and we have to care about all of our Canadian citizens. But there are some very real practical steps that we could and should be taking that we haven't, that have nothing to do with retaliation and everything to do with taking care of our Canadians. If we look at it now, we've had more than a year of detention, of this outrageous detention, yet we continue to pump trade missions and academic exchanges and cultural programs in, into China. If any other country had done this, we would have curtailed that. So the first thing we should be doing is cutting back on all of this government-sponsored or government-directed travel. We should be ensuring that Canadians hear loud and clear how dangerous China can be for them and how limited our options are. And we should be working with the like-minded to come up with a common uh, travel advisory, common language that expresses the danger. I think the Australians who have experienced this would be interested in joining us. The Swedes are going through this. This could be a powerful response to China, and it's one that's entirely in line with what the government should be doing. Another major uh, foreign policy hit for Canada this week, the loss of the bid for a UN Security Council seat. Uh, this is a government that came to power in 2015, saying Canada's back. They were convinced that they could get the seat. They poured millions of dollars into pursuing it. They were not able to get it. Why do you think that is, and what do you think it says about Canadian foreign policy? When you think about it, Mercedes, this week has brought us the defeat in New York on Wednesday, and then back on Friday we discovered what was happening to the two Michaels, that their, their, the charges were being brought against them. In many ways, it's one of the most disastrous weeks for foreign policy, Canadian foreign policy, in, in recent memory. We now have had, I think we've witnessed the death of one particular form of Canadian foreign policy, such as it was, with the Security Council defeat. The world apparently has decided that it actually does not need more Canada. We should take that lesson and recognize that that was a 1970s or 80s diplomacy at best. Time to move on from that old form of multilateralism. At the same time, the Chinese are reminding us that the world is much more dangerous for us, much colder, and that we need to invest in our own security and pushing back against Chinese interference uh, at home. And we need to be working with allies to try to limit and push back against Chinese uh, interference in other countries and efforts to undermine the system, the rule, uh, system of rules that Canada and others have put in place. So it's been a disastrous week, but sometimes you can move on from a disaster. I would suggest that the government not be too ambitious. They don't need to remake everything. They should start with getting China policy right, getting the language right, and taking the steps that Canadians have been waiting for them to take. An important discussion, no doubt. We appreciate your expertise and your time. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Mulroney. Thank you, Mercedes. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you for joining us. For the West Block, I'm Mercedes Stevenson.